All right, so today we're going to continue with European modernism uh, and especially focused on the international, what is known as the international style, uh, which comes out of Europe and especially out of Germany in the 1920s. So the origins, uh, there's there's a number of origins and principles that are involved that are going to be key for you to uh, remember and be aware of. Um, the modernist movement uh, really uh, comes out of the end of World War I. Uh, I think I made it mention when we were talking about the arts and crafts lectures that uh, World War I literally kills off the sort of romantic ideals and visions that uh, arts and crafts architects in, in Europe, the Art Nouveau uh, and secessionist styles uh, had been promoting the ideas of handcrafted and, and the connection to nature and sort of this idealistic, you know, medieval world uh, and the, the, the horrors and realities of uh, what was a horrific war and, people at the time thought was pretty, pretty awful, couldn't get any worse, and they didn't know about World War II yet. Uh, it, it really sort of ended that romantic, some of those romantic notions. And uh, it actually goes and, and uh, ironically comes out of this horror, uh, an embrace of the Industrial Revolution. And if, if the arts and crafts architects and followers had rejected, or at least in part rejected, the, the notion of machine-made goods and factories and technologies, modern technologies, or they wanted to limit that in architecture and art. Uh, the, the, the early modernists fully embraced it. And even, I think it was Le Corbusier who says that architects should be a machine for living and that modern technologies and construction and factory production would be a, a good thing for architecture and would create a, a, an architecture that would benefit society. Uh, and I'll, I think I'll try to make that pretty clear in, in some of those ways they were thinking both in today's lecture as well as we progress because it's, it's an idea that lasts well after even World War II into the uh, really into the 1960s. And so these international style modernist architects, they embrace the modern materials and construction techniques as we will see. And they also embrace the idea of what's known as the zeitgeist. And this is uh, the idea that an architecture should be of its time and place, uh, that, that it should not be a throwback to an earlier uh, era, you know, the, if the arts and crafts architects romanticized the medieval architecture and modeled at least some of their architecture on medieval architecture or, or other architects maybe embraced neoclassicism or something, the modernist architects felt that Gothic architecture was great it rep in, in the medieval era. It represented something new, the technologies and the skills and the desires of medieval craftspeople. But a 20th century architecture ought to represent the, the 20th century materials and desires and needs and realities. So um, that's known in architectural theory as the zeitgeist. And there's also a belief, and I, I think I touched on this a little bit, that architecture can be a force for social change. And I think that's, you know, was somewhat I I involved in the arts and crafts uh, philosophy as well, uh, but just in a different way. And the modernist architects, you know, looked at many of the social uh, issues and problems of the Industrial Revolution, and they thought, hey, this we can use the Industrial Revolution and architecture to solve the problems that are created by it. And this, you know, this is especially true of the 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 tenement housing, the slum housing that exists uh, as people flood into the cities for often low, very low wage jobs and menial jobs. 
uh, and, and the poor urban planning that arises out of that. And so we see a trend that continues, as I said, really into through the 1960s, that, that architecture can solve some of these problems. And we'll touch on that today as well. So uh, before we get into that, let's start with Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, I think when I was talking about Wright, I, I made mention several times of the Vosmuth portfolio and didn't really explain what that was, but this is now the time to explain what it is. So in 1909, Wright is living and working in Oak Park. He's got a wife and six children, and he literally almost overnight up packs up and leaves his family, his practice, his clients, his coworkers, and runs off to Europe with the wife of one of his clients, Mema Borthwick Cheney. And uh, the, the impetus for doing this is uh, an a, uh, invitation by uh, Ernst Vosmuth to write to a German publisher to create this and you know a portfolio of his projects to date and he would pay him to do that and Wright was always interested in getting paid for things because he spent money faster than he could make it um, most likely the reality is uh, that that was the official impetus for his leaving uh, more likely he was uh, having I guess you could call it a midlife crisis and was maybe a little bored with what he was doing and felt maybe a little confined by family and work and uh, various pressures. And this was a way for him to, to sort of break out of that. And he would do this several times throughout his life, almost reinventing himself and, and his career. This won't be the last time we talk about Frank Lloyd Wright, architecturally speaking. So uh, out of this, in 1910, is the publication of the Vosmuth Portfolio. And it is a uh, sort of groundbreaking uh, publication. He Wright had been published uh, in various periodicals and so forth, but um, this was this was the major opportunity for Europeans to become quite familiar with his work. Uh, and this is actually a print uh, rendering from uh, the portfolio of the Cheney House. So it is Mrs. Cheney that who she herself has two children and, and of course a husband and she and Wright have an affair. They'd been having the affair probably since he was designing uh, her, their house. Uh, and uh, they finally decide to both break from their families and run off, which is never a good thing, even in modern times. Um, but in, you know, 1909, this was a massive scandal. It hit the Chicago Tribune and the newspapers uh, around the region and uh, really ostracized him. He, when he did return from Europe, he never worked in Oak Park again, or at least didn't have his office in Oak Park, uh, and, and wound up moving with Mae Cheney to uh, and creating Taliesin in southern Wisconsin. Um, and how, how many people you can click uh, in your chat or something, how many people have been to Taliesin and, and seen that outside of Spring Green? So it's really an amazing place for those who have not been there. So here is uh, the typical type of Wasmuth print, uh, as I say, of the Cheney House. There were 100 plates in the portfolio. Here is the one for Wright's Home and Studio, which he publicizes as showing the front of the studio along Chicago Avenue. And you can see the, the floor plan. Uh, and this really, um, you know, shows his work very clearly, the, the floor plans, the renderings. Here is the print for Unity Temple. This is, Unity Temple especially was very influential to the architects that looked at the, uh, you know, through this, you know, some of the houses, you know, maybe a little over decorated for them, but this geometric massing, the, the pre-cast or the cast in place concrete, uh, the the space planning, this really fascinated them, and they they took to this. And I think in the last lecture, uh, Marcello pointed out that he he saw some visual similarities between the Viennese Secessionist Hall and Unity Temple, and just that raw geometric massing and the sort of simplification of ornament and decoration that uh, is on display here. And another uh, print was that was very influential was the 
Mrs. Gale House from 1909 here in Oak Park, uh, which we would have seen on our walking tour if we had been able to do that. Uh, here is a rendering of it, and this is the photograph of it as it looks today. And there's a lot of similarities in a way to uh, Unity Temple. If this is plaster uh, or stucco coated frame rather than concrete, but it looks you know, uh, a monolithic like a concrete structure would with just a little bit of wood trim around the perimeter. And these uh, projecting balconies and the projecting roof line in front, uh, creating these strong geometric masses really influenced European architects. And then uh, the, the, if, if the solid stucco masses are, are solids, the voids are these ribbon windows, these bands of, of art glass windows and, and doors that Wright uses to open up visually and, and literally with doors uh, to between the, the, the barrier between the house and nature and to create uh, a more of a unity between man and nature that he strived for. And so we're gonna see a lot of these principles carry over into early uh, modernist architecture. Here's the print for the Hurtley House, also in Oak Park. And if you remember, this uh, Hurtley House has these horizontal bands of masonry, including uh, sort of a darker red and almost an orange colored brick. And I point a couple of these out to show you one example of an early modernist project. This is from 1927 in Potsdam, just outside of Berlin. Uh, the architect is Eric Mendelssohn, uh, the Dr. Bejak House. And Mendelssohn uh, would be a prominent modernist architect uh, and with a ver variety of projects. We're not going to talk too much about him, but uh, this, this house in particular has very, very strong connections. You can really see the, the influence that Wright and, and his Wasmuth portfolio had on, on early modernist architecture. They'll begin to break out of that uh, and away from right and create something more unique and, and uh, individual. But uh, these early, some of these early projects have very strong connections to Frank Lloyd Wright. So here we see in this historic photograph, those horizontal bands of brick masonry, much like the Hurtley house had. We see the sort of wide overhanging eaves uh, that uh, like the Gale house has. And we see the, the, the garden walls stretching out away from the house and creating this anchor to nature the way that Wright would do like at the Hurtley house with the wide garden walls there. And I was uh, fortunately to visit the house about 10 years ago and talk with the owner who's a prominent preservation architect and got a few images. So here you see how it looks and you see those horizontal bands of brick and the wide overhanging eaves. In this case, he's using, a, uh, Mendelssohn uses a flat roof, um, much like the Gale House. And we see, uh, especially here at the top, this band of, of windows. Now, uh, it doesn't use the art glass windows the way Wright does, but we see this band of windows that, you know, creates this or breaks down that barrier between man and nature. And a few more details of the exterior of the house, some of the garden walls up at the top right, and, and a detail of the brick masonry on the left. And then that's, uh, that's Mr. Pitts, the, the architect. And he, just a funny story, uh, that's his daughter who was uh, in college at the time. And uh, he didn't speak any German, or excuse me, he didn't speak any English, and I really don't speak any German. So his daughter, who had just come back from uh, uh, an English immersion in, in London or in Cambridge, uh, was our interpreter, and uh, what was funny is that uh, that as he would talk and mention architectural things, I, I kind of caught on and and mostly knew what he was talking about even before she, uh, I think her name was Helena, even before Helena could explain as best she could because some of the architectural technical terms she was struggling with. So uh, even though we spoke two totally different languages, we both spoke, we both spoke uh, architecture and, and I was able to get most of the gist of it. Uh, so it was kind of a fun day and he served me lunch. It was a very nice, uh, nice thing. So here's another project in Berlin. This is a housing complex designed by Bruno Taut, also a very prominent early modernist architect. Uh, this dates from uh, the mid-1920s, finished in stages uh, by 1930. 
And we see, again, this is more of an apartment block, but we see the similar kinds of influence uh, carrying over from right, some horizontal bands of masonry, uh, not, not quite emphasizing all horizontality the way Frank Lloyd Wright would do. We're already starting to see a breakout into a more international style of architecture here. But there is some carryover with those horizontal bands and the overhangs of the the roofs at the at the balconies, a few details there. And uh, this also, housing projects are an early form of modernist architecture in Germany. Uh, there, was, there was definitely a housing crunch in the 1920s, um, again, partly because of tenement housings and slums. Uh, as, as people flooded to the cities, um, both for the Industrial Revolution to get factory jobs and so forth, but also because of World War I and after the war, people came to the cities looking for better opportunities and the, the economy in Germany wasn't very good. So people were looking for anything they could. So these kinds of housing projects uh, were starting to be built as ways to provide this you know, social need for people. And we'll see an example at the end of our lecture today of uh, a major international style one. So the first architect I really want to talk about in uh, detail is uh, Peter Behrens. And Behrens, uh, we can kind of consider to be the, the father or grandfather of German modernism and, and the international style. Uh, he founds, uh, in the teens, he founds uh, a, a group called the Deutscher Werkbund, uh, which translates as German Workshop. And this was a design school that, uh, an organization really, that uh, promoted good modern design. And it was based on the Wiener Werkstatt that Josef Hoffmann had created in Vienna with the secessionists. And it, it's less of a school, and it's really more like-minded professionals who uh, sort of work together. They, they trade information, share information. Maybe they say, hey, I've got a client. You can, you know, I can... Uh, you can help me out with this particular project and that sort of thing. And uh, the Deutsche Werkbund initially was an embrace, like the, Via, like the Wiener Werkstatt, was an embrace of the arts and crafts movement as it existed in Germany. But as I said, World War I essentially ends the, the arts and crafts movement. And Behrens and the people who were following him began to drift into more of a uh, international style of modernist architecture. And in fact, one of the reasons why he's called the father, grandfather of modernism is because at one point uh, in, in, in his career, uh, Behrens had Walter Gropius, Mies van der Rohe, and Le Corbusier all working in his office. Um, possibly all three at the very same time, certainly two of them uh, working together uh, at the same time in the office. And even Mies van der Rohe um, uh, in, in, a, in a statement or, or reminisce or something like that talked about uh, Behrens had a copy of the Vosmuk portfolio in his office and they would, you know, the, the people in the office would sometimes just sort of filter through the portfolio, looking at the drawings and sort of absorbing the ideas that Wright was doing. And, and he was always clear that they, they didn't want to copy what Wright had done, they, uh, but they were very influenced by his ideas of space and massing and geometry and ultimately would create a modernist movement out of, in part, out of the ideas that Wright had put forth in the Vasmuk portfolio. Uh, so Barron's, one of his major clients was uh, the AEG company, uh, and this is a poster he designed for them in 1908. So this is still uh, before World War One, still almost in the Wiener, uh, in the Deutsche Werkbahn mode, a more arts and crafts type mode here. And the AEG was the German equivalent of uh, General Electric. They were the big power company. Uh, so they were generating power. They were making light bulbs. They had a monopoly. This was back in the age when power companies had a monopoly and so forth. It's kind of like the telephone. Bell Telephone had a monopoly uh, well into the 1980s. And so uh, this was a major client to have. They had projects all over. And one of his most important works for them was a turbine factory. Uh, this is in Berlin and dates from 1908 to 1909. So this is, again, before World War I, 
Uh, there's still some elements of the German arts and crafts slash secessionist movement here. Uh, and you can see that even uh, with the horizontal masonry bands at the front of the building here. And, and even almost a, I'd almost call it a quaint uh, Dutch gambrel type of roof there. Now it's, it's actually pretty expressive of the bow trusses that uh, frame this space, but um, cladding this whole front facade with this, um, with this canted and curved masonry with the horizontal lines is a little bit of that reminiscing of, of the arts and crafts movement. But uh, this is also one of the very first true modernist buildings. There's, uh, you can see the huge um, glazed wall here at the front. And along the side, I'll show you a detail in the moment, are, uh, is a true, really expressive modernist uh, industrial revolution facade. Here is a uh, graphic poster uh, highlighting the building and showing one of the light fixtures that uh, the company produced. And a detail of the, or photo of the building as it exists. Uh, fortunately, this was not bombed by Allied bombers uh, as much of Berlin was. So this survived the war and we can see it. It's been pretty well maintained. Um, needs a little bit of restoration work on the steel, but you can see the front. You can see how that those brick masonry piers. You see the horizontal lines, but see how it's canted, it kind of angles up in here and you have the curved lines. That's, that's still a little bit of the arts and crafts movement left over. Uh, but in our next photo, next couple slides, we'll see the more industrial um, expression of the building. Here is a, a section through the building and a, on the far right is a, an elevation of the side. So in the section, we see these uh, trusses that come out up vertically and then kind of a bow, almost a bowstring type trust here at the top with a large skylight at the very top. And this creates this massive open work area for creating the turbines, which are big, huge pieces of industrial equipment. So they didn't, they didn't want columns and, and various floor levels in here. They needed a big open space. So uh, like the big train sheds of the 19th century uh, industrial revolution, we see a very engineered structural uh, solution to the building frame. But what is unique and somewhat unlike the train sheds of the 19th century is that Barron's embraces that. And we see a little bit here with the elevation on the right, uh, where the, the side walls really just become fully glazed uh, walls with these columns, these steel columns, uh, fully expressed in between. You see the rivets, you see the connectors, uh, you see um, the, the steel frame of the windows themselves, and it's it's none of it's hidden. Uh, you know, architects in the past would have all been tempted to hide the you know hide this behind walls. You know, make it look like a ionic column or something like that. Here we see it completely uh, devoid of ornamentation, devoid of any architectural expression other than the structure itself. And this is one of the fundamental principles of the modernist movement. Uh, even down to the details here at the very bottom, I love this uh, connection between the, the vertical pier and the foundation. And uh, this is almost ornamental and decorative in itself, as is the, the rivet patterns. And I think the, the modernist architects, that's how they believed this. They, they didn't want a building that was completely ugly per se, uh, they, you know, but they saw beauty in these kinds of details and they saw beauty in this true, honest expression of the structure of what they called the zeitgeist. 